Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing pain and analgesics. Okay, right, so we're in the process of discussing inflammatory pain, okay, and we've just discussed how bradykinin is capable of sensitizing uh, nociceptors. Okay, so we saw that bradykinin activates the GQ cascade, which leads to the production of a calcium signal along with diacylglycerol. Now, this is capable of activating a huge number of different protein kinase Cs. However, the one that is, uh, seems to be important for the phosphorylation of trip v one is protein kinase C epsilon, which is a novel protein kinase C, and therefore isn't activated by calcium, but is only activated by diacylglycerol. So the diacylglycerol you produce activates the protein kinase C epsilon, which then phosphorylates the trip v one channel, and this uh, sensitizes the trip v one channel so that it will now open uh, and allow uh, current, excitatory current, through it at lower temperatures than previously. So usually trip V1 only activates at temperatures greater than 45 degrees Celsius. But after phosphorylation by protein kinase C epsilon, it's now going to open at lower temperatures. And that underlies uh, thermal allodynia, uh, whereby previously innocuous temperatures are now going to cause uh, noxious uh, experiences because they're going to activate these nociceptors. So that's going to affect both the thermal nociceptors and the polymodal nociceptors which have the trip v1 channel in okay right now what we want to do is turn our attention to another component of the inflammatory milieu and have a look at its effects uh, in sensitizing nociceptors okay so this final component of the inflammatory milieu that we're going to study is nerve growth factor ngf Okay, so uh, this is an incredibly important protein in embryology. Okay, it's incredibly important in the development of the nervous system, but it also plays an important role in inflammatory pain. Okay, and in areas of inflammation, nerve growth factor starts to be produced and it elevates in the uh, tissue fluid. Okay, right. Now, the nerve endings of nociceptors have receptors for nerve growth factor on their surface. Okay, so if this is a uh, free nerve ending of some nociceptor, then I'll draw the receptor for nerve growth factor here. Okay, now this receptor is known as TRAK-A, T-R-K-A for short. Okay, so that's TRAK-A. Okay, and um, basically um, TRAK-A is a receptor tyrosine kinase, so it has a huge number of different pathways downstream of it. So, what's going to happen is when nerve growth factor binds to the track A, which I'll show like so, here's the nerve growth factor here, binding to the track A, that will cause conformational changes in the track A, which will then allow it to dimerize with another track A receptor, okay, like so. And this other track A receptor will need to have a nerve growth factor molecule also bound to it. Okay, so here are two track A molecules, both with nerve growth factor molecules bound, and they can now dimerize, so I'll draw some connection there. Okay, now, this dimer of track A receptors is now capable of uh, activating a huge number of different signaling cascades, which we're not quite uh, going to go through. We're going to summarize them down to a line, okay? But it would take me a very long time to explain all of the pathways downstream of receptor tyrosine kinases. Okay, so we're not going to do that. We're going to summarize them down to a line. But the key thing that receptor tyrosine kinases do is they alter gene expression, okay? They alter the activity of transcription factors, which then alters gene expression, okay? So gene expression refers to which genes in the genome are actually going to be expressed and produce proteins, and to what level are they going to be expressed. Now, uh, this um, track A dimer currently is right down in the periphery, okay, at, on the membrane of this free nerve ending, okay. If it is going to affect gene expression, it needs to be up near the nucleus of this cell. Now, where is the nucleus of this cell? All the way up in the dorsal root ganglia, okay. Uh, so, it's not going to be able to set off the cascade from right down here. So what actually happens is a phenomenon that is termed retrograde transport. And this basically involves 
the trache uh, dimer being endocytosed into an endocytic vesicle, and then this endocytic vesicle being transported up the nociceptor, up the axon of the primary nociceptive afferent, all the way up to the uh, cell body, and then, when it gets there, having its signaling cascade. So let me show this. So what's going to happen is we're going to produce an endocytic vesicle here, which will have our trache receptor dimer here, with nerve growth factor molecules bound here. Okay, so let's cover that in. So here are the track A receptors in red here, dimerized together, so connected like so. And then you've got the nerve growth factor molecules in blue here. Okay, and this is now going to be transported up the nociceptor, up the axon, all the way up to the cell body. So now let me show you the cell body. So let's say this is the cell body of our primary nociceptive afferent. So it will come up this single process that comes off the cell body. Okay, here is the nucleus of our primary nociceptive afferent, and here is the endocytic vesicle, drawn a little bit out of scale compared to the nucleus, but so that you can see it, this is how I'm drawing it. Okay, uh, and it's now arrived in the cell body. Okay, so here is the track A dimer, like so, and then you've still got those nerve growth factor. Um, molecules bound to it. Okay, now this is going to set up all sorts of signaling cascades, horrendously complicated signaling cascades, that are going to lead to changes in gene expression. So we will just summarize them as an arrow here, okay? They are going to change gene expression. Okay, now which genes are they going to affect the expression of? Well, this is the basic principle. You're going to make more copies of the receptors for noxious stimuli, okay? And you're going to put them in the nerve-free endings, and that's going to make you more sensitive now to the presence of the noxious stimuli. It's effectively going to cause hyperalgesia. Okay, right. So, let me say which specific uh, receptors are going to have their expression increased. So, trip V1 is going to have its expression increased, okay? Um, also, P2X3 is going to have its expression increased. And finally, also, ASIC3 is known to have its expression increased by the track A receptor. Okay, so what's now going to happen? Well, the density of these in the nerve free ending is now going to go up. So let's illustrate this principle for trip V1 here. So now what's going to happen is we're going to get loads more new trip V1s produced here. Okay, so here they are. So I'll colour these in in turquoise. Now, if you imagine what's going to happen when you go above the threshold temperature for the opening of the trip V1s now, then you're going to get far more trip V1s opening, and therefore the amount of excitatory current that you're going to be getting coming into the nerve free ending is going to be much, much bigger. And therefore, this is going to produce much more frequent action potentials being generated by the nociceptor, okay, which corresponds to more pain. So this underlies hyperalgesia then, okay, one of the other components of uh, sensitization. Okay, so by upregulating these um, components of these ion channels, and of course these are the subunits of these ion channels, they'll have to tetramerize together in the case of trip V1 and trimerize together in the case of P2X3 and ASIC3, okay? Uh, but the overall result is that you're going to increase the density of these ion channels and therefore you're going to increase the response you get for a certain amount of the noxious stimulus and therefore you're going to get hyperalgesia because of that. Okay, so those three are all upregulated in response to the track A receptor. In addition, let me tell you about something else that track A uh, increases the expression of. It also increases the expression of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is something we haven't seen before. This is BDNF, or brain derived neurotrophic factor. Now this is another uh, peptide neurotransmitter. Okay, so you remember me telling you that the primary nociceptive afferents, when they synapse onto the thalamocortical, sorry, not thalamocortical, the spinothalamic projection neurons, okay, the second order neurons, I'll just try and find a picture here, okay, that picture of the spinal cord 
transverse section, if I can. Uh, here we go. Right. So when the um, primary nociceptive afferents here synapse onto these spinothalamic projection neurons, they use not only glutamate but also peptide neurotransmitters, substance P. Basically, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, is another one of these peptide neurotransmitters. So you can now put this in these electron-dense uh, vesicles here, okay? and. Uh, it will also be released, and that will also have depolarizing effects on the um, postsynaptic uh, secondary, secondary um, spinothalamic projection neurons, and therefore you're going to increase the amount of activation that you're delivering to these postsynaptic neurons. So you're going to basically increase the ability of the axon terminals of these primary um, nociceptive afferents to trigger action potentials in the spinothalamic projection neurons by increasing the expression of brain-derived neurotrophic factor in this way. Okay, right, so that's another uh, consequence of the activation of track A receptors, the upregulation of this new signaling molecule that can be used as a neurotransmitter between uh, the primary nociceptive afferents and the secondary uh, spinothalamic projection neurons. Okay, right, so that is now nerve growth factor finished, the final component of the inflammatory milieu that I'm going to discuss.